Okay. So just to introduce uh, Lonnie, so Dr. Lonnie Basankan is a postdoctoral fellow at um, Monash University, Australia, where he'll move in January. And he previously worked at the Linköping University in Sweden. His research focuses on 3D human computer interaction, as well as the communication and visualization of statistical results. And he's a keen advocate for open science. So I'll hand it over to Lonnie to continue the presentation. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about this paper. So just a very, very brief uh, intro and recap of my work before we dive into the paper. So uh, what I did indeed during my PhD was working on 3D interaction for uh, human computer interaction and visualization. So the idea was to try and develop data sets um, or devices and techniques to try and help people dive. We have to dive into 3D data sets for their work. So people working with fluid dynamic data or even medical data to try and help them understand their data in a, an easier fashion somehow. Um, I also worked uh, after this on uh, shocking content and how we could uh, try to make it a little bit less shocking but still informative. So we use surgery images for this so that to, we could enable, for instance, surgeons to explain a specific procedure to their patients with images without actually having the patients grow up. Um, so we developed a plugin for, for this that also works online. So you can actually go onto a Wikipedia page for a specific procedure or anything like go through social media and see shocking content in a less shocking-ish uh, way thanks to this. Um, I also worked uh, quite a lot on uh, on open science, uh, obviously, um, did a couple of uh, work here and there, blog post, uh, contributed with a paper recently uh, before the COVID-19 paper uh, with John Tennant uh, and other people from my university uh, on the open and non-anonymized peer reviewing and how it works and what people see uh, there as like potential benefits in my field in particular. And being interested in reproducibility and everything else, I also dived into um, statistics and how they communicated and used in my field in particular, and published a couple of papers on this. Uh, so for instance, this one uh, that's basically looking at how people present statistical results in my field, and they still use a lot of very dichotomous inferences for their results. So basically going for just uh, results that are significant or not significant, and even disregarding completely effect size, which is a little bit awkward. Um, recently published a paper on the threats of a replication crisis in empirical computer science, looking at how people also present their results in different fields, looking at the top journals and seeing there again a lot of dichotomous inferences, which has been said to lead to potentially the, the replication crisis. So we actually argue that there is a risk uh, in this paper. And uh, the last thing I did was looking at how people describe their results with words, actually, uh, like more beyond the whole significant, not significant. And there's lots of words, uh, linguistic devices you can use there to, to describe uh, your, your own results. So if we take a medical trial, for instance, uh, there's a couple of examples here. So this paper is not out yet. That's why there's no link to it. Um, it's being peer reviewed right now. I couldn't post the preprint just yet. So um, but the, the, the name is there. Uh, as a reference to a famous uh, rock band from, from the UK, uh, definitely maybe. So showing these two linguistic devices, one being very certain, definitely, and maybe, which shows uncertainty. Um, going back to the open science paper now. So of course, it will be uh, my name mentioned as the first author on, on this, but it's actually a huge collaboration. And this paper would not have happened with uh, all of these people, with Nathan, Corentin, Hayting, Paola, Cooper, Eric, Maxim, and Clemence. Everyone put in a lot of work on this, on their free time. So uh, it's really like kudos to, to all of them. They, they did an amazing work and it's like they deserve most of the credit as well. Um, you can see here pictures of everyone. Uh, you can see that mine is quite outdated actually, but uh, everyone else should be uh, kind of okay. Um, but it was an international collaboration. So it was very nice to have people working from different places. You can see here Belgium, France, Sweden, the UK, Australia, and China. Um, it was a very nice collaboration and it all started on Twitter uh, during the pandemic. So that was actually something, uh, kind of a victory, some, you know, kind of a story you want to tell as well. Um, so it all started, I guess, with, with this, you know, like it really made the news, this whole Lensagate and the paper that was retracted uh, for potentially fraudulent or made of data um, that shocked the whole scientific community. But beyond this, something that actually shocked most of the authors of the paper is it's this one paper that was shared from from a lab in the south of France with a potential treatment for, for COVID, which is hydroxychloroquine. Uh, it's been since then completely disproved. But if you look at the paper in detail, you can see two shocking things. The first thing is this one. The paper was received on the 3rd of April and it was accepted on the 4th of April. 
So that means that the whole peer reviewing and editorial work around the paper uh, was done in a single day, which is a little bit odd, even considering that we want to fast track things during a pandemic. The second thing is that uh, the first offer here is also part of the editorial board of the journal. So that makes it a little bit weird. And considering that the paper has obvious flaws in its methodology, um, you kind of wonder why it was accepted in the first place. Uh, but I'll go back into this. But then we, I personally looked at a lot of data from this lab, and you can see it here. So you have the title of the paper on the left. Uh, in the middle, you see the number of days uh, that the paper was reviewed for. So you see a lot of ones here because uh, lots of the papers were accepted or peer reviewed and accepted in a day. Um, and you see on the uh, far right column that it's uh, most of them don't have an NA. So all of the text actually describes the potential editorial conflict of interest. So most of this uh, team lab in the south of France published uh, a lot of, uh, of paper on COVID. That's only the COVID-19 papers that were accepted very fast and with editorial conflict of interest. So it's a little bit odd. So I, st I started on this looked at the data, I uh, was bored one night, finished uh, the analysis at 4 or something a.m., put it on Twitter as saying like, okay, this is something weird that like we have to investigate. And uh, and I woke up to a lot of notification on Twitter the next day, uh, which surprised me a little. But basically what people wanted to do was to, to, to conduct, uh, which I also thought of, a systematic analysis of how things are going in terms of transparency and publication during COVID. Um, and so we we set out to do this. Uh, that's how this paper started, uh, just on Twitter and then creating a Slack channel and starting hacking at it. Um, so if you know a little bit of open science, and I guess most of you do, but quick uh, reminder here, the three of the main concepts usually are uh, open access, of course, which gives uh, access to papers to everyone without a fee. Um, then there's potentially open peer review and uh, a lot of other concepts such as open data, open materials and pre-registration sometimes are also into it. And all of these concepts have different impact on the um, publication pipeline. So you can see here if you try to put arrows where that would impact, uh, it's kind of fuzzy. So we made our own figure for this, uh, detailing this version of the publication pipeline. So first you have the data collection and interpretation step, which is basically you have your research questions, so you design a study and prepare for a data analysis, you plan your data analysis, then you interpret your results. Then there's the publication process step, which is basically putting potentially a preprint. You don't necessarily have to, Some most people do now, I guess, but uh, you don't have to. Then you submit the manuscript, it's being peer reviewed, you can iterate a couple of times like this. Eventually it is hopefully published and uh, some people do share data and code, which is nice. And at the end is the communication step, which is basically the citations that comes from your peers and they use um, in, uh, in media, social media and potentially policy making documents. Um, what we highlight next in this figure is the potential issues that can arise from this. Uh, so first of all, your study design might be flawed or the analysis that you're conducting might not be appropriate for the kind of data you have or for the kind of outcome you want to measure. Uh, then you could also misinterpret, uh, like either misinterpret the data or misreport it, right? That doesn't have to be intentional, but uh, it can also be intentional in some cases. Um, if you talk about the preprint, well, it could be used as a reliable source by people outside or within academia, which could be an issue if it hasn't been peer reviewed and validated. Uh, I mean, there's some screening now for COVID-19 papers, but before Archive and other websites were just used, there was a slight screening process, but uh, it doesn't really prevent uh, crazy papers from being published there. Um, and if we talk about the whole rest of the publication process, well, this fast track of peer review, that could be an issue. Uh, we know that peer review is not perfect, so it can fail to identify errors. Um, there's potentially conflict of interest that are not being reported, either editorial or financial. Lots of things can happen. And in the paper at the end with this figure, we also detail our solution. Uh, I'm not gonna walk you, walk you through this right now. Uh, I'll do it within the presentation. So let's start with, uh, whatever we analyzed for the data collection and interpretation step. So first of all, we looked at retraction watch, which I suppose most of you know. Um, there were back then, I think it was in June, 29 papers that had been retracted on COVID-19. Um, and out of these 29 papers, eight of them actually had issues with uh, the study design of the analysis of the data. That's the, that's the first issue. Um, then if you, Imagine some kind of pandemic going on. You would expect several treatments to, to be investigated by scientists, uh, potentially a lot more than three, but let's say three for now. 
Um, what happened actually for, for COVID is that one treatment was really heavily investigated, whereas the others were a little bit left out. And if we're uh, quite transparent about what treatment was actually really investigated, it was uh, hydroxychloroquine. And uh, this crazy investigation onto hydroxychloroquine all started with one of the papers that I mentioned earlier, which had issues with its study design and data analysis. That's the paper that was peer reviewed in a day. So potentially we spend a lot of effort on a treatment that has been by now disproved for, for nothing because the initial paper was not really good anyways. Um, so of course, if we uh, if we think about, okay, it's, it's all an issue of time, right? Now we can investigate this, these other treatments. If time is the only issue, yes, but there's other things to consider in, in science. And I guess most of you know this, but there's also money, of course. Um, and But in the case of medical trials, we also need uh, people to participate in the trials. And all these resources have basically been focused mostly on hydroxychloroquine and some other treatments like Cronium severe, but uh, not a lot of the others potential treatments. So that's a problem. And so the studies that we could have been conducted with more time might not even be conducted ever because of this. So there was a lot of duplication on hydroxychloroquine studies that led to a waste of scientific resources. And so usually when you look at the publication pipeline, when people try to improve it, one thing that is often mentioned is pre-registration. So before you collect your data, you pre-register and you say, this is the analysis I'm going to do. And that avoids a lot of issues like spin and a lot of things like this. But it's not enough when we consider everything we've seen, right? The, the application of research, the waste of resources, and the issue with design uh, studies, right? Because like this pre-registration is not peer reviewed. So a thing that is often implemented now, especially in psychology, is what we call registered reports. So registered reports, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but uh, the idea is pretty simple. You have your research question or the idea you want to test. You design your study and you submit this for peer review. You don't start the study at all. You don't collect data, you don't do anything. You just submit this for peer review, iterate a couple of times. Eventually, this gets accepted if it's a um, robust enough protocol. Then you start your, your trial or study, collect data, analyze the data, write the report, and then you submit for a minor uh, peer review cycle, which is a stage two peer review. And if you've done everything that you plan to do in the first step, then the paper is published. Um, so the good thing with that is that we don't waste resources anymore because all the potential issues are seen beforehand, before you start collecting data. So that's that's a pretty good solution. So if we sum up this whole data collection and study design phase, um, this uh, the potential issues that we've seen is a waste of research because uh, of research resources because of duplication, some ethical concerns that I didn't detail there in the paper, and uh, potentially a lot of load studies. The solutions that we advocate for is pre-registration and registered reports, but they only work if everything is made public, right? If we don't want to duplicate research, then that means the pre-registration or registered report, whenever it is submitted, should be made available to everyone so that I can check, okay, this team is already working on this, so uh, this other team also, so there's already three or four parallel studies running on this treatment, I, I'm not going to attest it for them. And who should adopt this? Of course, it's researchers uh, that have to adopt it, but it's also journals that have to enforce it. I think, uh, if especially registered report, it's a slight change of how the publication paradigm works. So uh, journals should really start enforcing it. Let's go on to the second step, the publication process and the issues and solutions we found there. So I mentioned this paper before, reviewed in a single day with uh, editorial conflict of interest. Uh, so we actually wanted to see if this was uh, something that happened in other places, right? So we looked at data from PubMed, took all the papers on COVID-19, a bit more than 12,000 of them. Uh, 8,455 uh, of these papers had a peer review time available as metadata. So we took these out and we uh, analyzed the peer review time and we found that we could make three different groups of papers. The papers that have been published uh, were peer-reviewed and published in less than 24 hours. And based on the data we had, we saw that the mean and the median of the reviewing time were 16 days and 20 days. So we just analyzed these two as some form of control groups. Um, so it, we had a lot of data, really a lot. Uh, I have more than, uh, I think it's more than a thousand papers that we had to analyze in total. And for all these papers, we had to classify them, like what kind of papers are there, but also try to check for a total conflict of interest. So for each paper, we went onto the papers, see the author list, and then compared onto the editorial board webpage, the names and affiliations 
to try and see if they were uh, the same persons, right? It was it was a little bit tricky. It was all manual. It took a couple of days, um, so it was uh, <laughs> it was quite intense. Um, so one thing that we did as well is to try and separate proper research articles, so articles presenting new results, new findings, new evidence for something, from editorials or viewpoints or letters, because you would expect that these editorials of Obviously, they, they are written by the editors, so the authors are the editors of the journal. This is fine. The letters and viewpoint, they are often in correspondence with the editors. They're, they're often invited by the editors, so it could be totally OK to, to have editorial conflict of interest there. For research article, probably not so much. Um, so here are the results we obtained. Uh, so you can see two subfigures. The first one at the top is the data for research articles, and the one at the bottom is the one for reviews, editorials, viewpoints, and letter. Um, if you look at the part on the right, it's all the different conflict of interest types, so editor-in-chief, associate editor or editor, uh, and the data on the left is the aggregated version of this. So we're going to just focus on, on this part. Um, so the first thing that we can notice, especially for research articles, not for uh, the others, is that as peer reviewing time increases, we see a decrease in the editorial conflict of interest. So that's that's the first thing we have to, to see. But the, the thing that's a little bit surprising in these results is that you would really expect that editorial-ish papers like review, viewpoint, and et cetera, would have much higher rates of conflict of interest than, than research articles. But when you look at these two numbers, they're not really so far off, uh, which is uh, a little bit interesting. So that doesn't mean that all of these papers um, because they have editorial conflict of interest are not valid. Like it's totally okay for editors to submit papers to their own journals. Uh, but if you combine this with a single day peer review, that's getting a little bit shady, especially if we don't have access to the peer review uh, reports, which is exactly what we advocate as a solution. We need more transparency and open reviews. So we give guidelines on things that we think should be implemented. So first of all, authors should always highlight in the manuscript and the metadata any affiliation with the editorial board of the journal. The second thing is that journals should always explicitly state how the peer review was conducted. That means that they should say how many referees were recruited, how long the whole peer review process was, but also break it down into how long it took to find all the reviewers, how long it took for the reviewers to submit the reviews. So of course, uh, that won't say how long they took to do, to do the reviews, but still, and how long the editorial decision uh, took to be made. Uh, a third thing is that we want journals to make all the reference reports uh, of all the accepted papers available uh, for everyone transparently with the manuscript so that the authors, the reviewers, the whole scientific community, journalists could also benefit from the, all the comments that are made in the, in the reviews, right? But also so that we could check, for instance, for these papers that were published in one day, uh, how thorough the reviewing was. So, as a person, I can say, okay, the, this, these reviews are pretty thorough. It was it, it was done quite fast, but it's still a very good job. So this paper is uh, probably valid. And finally, something that we also advocate for in the in the paper is that if you have quantitative findings, it might be smart to have some form of statistical board uh, within your journal with statisticians that can actually analyze the, all the papers reporting statistical results. Uh, because they they usually know better than people who just you know practice statistics uh, for for the research field, which is uh, a lot different. Uh, another thing that of course uh, draw our attention is the whole Lensagate uh, thing. So this paper uh, published with data from Sergisphere that got retracted because uh, Sergisphere refused to give the data, and almost all of the authors, almost none of the authors actually saw the data. So eventually got retracted for, retracted from the Lancet, and another paper from uh, the same offer list was removed from uh, NEJM. So we looked at retraction watch again to see if it happened more than this, and we actually found four papers with uh, missing or potentially fraudulent data. So the obvious solution to this, uh, people in the open science community would know it right away, is to have open materials and open data that would uh, solve the issue. So we give a couple of recommendations again. So research materials for data generation and collection um, such as questionnaires, algorithm scripts for analysis should be made available on the platforms that they, uh, are useful for this and published, if possible, with a CC BY license. 
data should be shared by default. Um, it seems that it's when you when you when I say that to people, they say, yeah, but it's the case already. This journal does it. Yeah, but but it's not the case. It's not the default everywhere. It's it's the default for some of the main big journals, but even in the Lancet was uh, didn't have this right. So or they do, but then you can just go around it ish and just say that you can't share the data and that's it, which which is fine with what we say here, right? Authors should share the data, raw data, if they can, or say why they can't. But in case they can, and that's why we try to put some emphasis, we want the journal editors to be able to demand that the raw data is actually checked by a trusted third party. So someone that the editors or the editorial board and the authors agree on, and that the law eventually allows, um, so that we can check that the scripts do run, we can check that the data is there, we can check that the scripts actually give this these specific results. Um, and then the, this trusted third party can just sign a small report saying everything runs and this is what it gives, which is exactly what's in the paper. Um, so it's something that we think could be easily implemented. It wouldn't necessarily break every like privacy and anonymity issue for, for the data, especially in the medical field. So uh, we, I think it's, a, it's a, we think, we all think it's a, it's a nice thing to have. And finally, to facilitate meta-analysis, uh, all of the abstract of the manuscript submitted should have the pre-registration numbers, the data repositories, and the open source repositories available right away, so that it's just easy to do without, even if the paper is not open access. And uh, we would like to encourage publishers to consider also directly including the information in the paper's XML information to just allow for a very, very easy retrieval of all this data through text mining. Uh, that would be perfect. So summing up this second step, the publication process, so the issues we found were the fast track of peer reviewing, uh, combined with editorial conflict of interest, and the distrust of published result that happened after the retraction of this uh, major paper from the Lancet. Um, solutions for this is obviously open data and open, uh, open source code. And uh, disclosure of conflict of interest, uh, including for editorial roles, and having a review. The issue with data and code sharing is that we need policies to change to allow it. So that's why we need we put this agent uh, case here. We say that it's, of course, up to researchers to adopt it and journals to enforce it, but we also need institutions and funding agencies to value the kind of things that we do. So they need to value open review, they need to value uh, the code that we share. But we also need policymakers to find a way to allow this uh, data to be shared, even if just to a trusted third party. Now to the last step, science communication and news. Um, so the first issue during the pandemic was that most publishers actually advertised that their, their papers were, were open access, which is uh, some form of uh, you know, white lie potentially. Uh, the COVID-19 papers were open access, that's very true. But if you're developing a vaccine for, for COVID, you need access to papers from immunology, virology, and probably a lot of other fields, right? And these were not open access. So um, yeah, saying that papers are open access during the pandemic was a bit of a stretch, maybe. Uh, the second thing that we noticed is that the archiving preprint platforms, such as Archive, BioArchive, MedArchive, and all the others, they saw a huge increase in the number of submissions they had, which it's a good thing. Uh, the not so good thing, maybe, is that uh, we actually posited that um, maybe newspapers would use preprints a lot more, especially because they want to report on COVID. So we set out to find if it was true, and for that we used the uh, altmetric that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, so here's the altmetric page for this paper. Um, so you can see here some kind of like general score, uh, which doesn't say much, but what you can look at is this. Uh, how the paper was shared, so like on Twitter, Wikipedia, Reddit, uh, YouTube and video, website, blogs, lots of things. Uh, and they have an API, so you can just send them a DOI and then get the results back, and it tells you that uh, this paper has been shared here, 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 and then you can see the overall score and everything. So we decided to look at this for, for COVID-19 preprints. Uh, so what we did is we went back on these platforms and extracted all the preprints published from the 1st of January to the 30th of June. And then we divided them into COVID papers and non-COVID papers. And here are the results. So you can see the percentage of preprints that were actually shared at least once. Uh, on Twitter, the numbers are huge, uh, probably because it's automated when you post a preprint on BioArchive, for instance, it's automatically tweeted when it's available. Uh, but what's interesting here 
as the percentage of share in news. And we see here that the COVID-19 papers were shared almost 10 times more than any other preprint topic, right? So that's that's a little bit uh, of, a, of a sign that uh, something wor worrying might be going on. Because as I said, preprints can be totally valid, but you're not sure until you find a way to validate them. And if they're shared in the news, and if the language used to share them in the news is not appropriate, then it might lead to actually misinformation of the public, which is not great. So an obvious solution to this is to have more communication between journalists and scientists. Uh, but there's problems with that, of course, I'll, I'll get back to it. Um, so to sum it up, um, when it comes to communication, we saw potential misuse of preprints by the media. Uh, we saw the open access, but not really open access. Um, and I'll come back to the last issue at the end. Um, obvious solutions were open access for all manuscripts, no matter the topic, of course, and a tighter collaboration between journalists and scientists. Um, who should implement that? Uh, that's a little bit tricky. So first of all, the thing is that journalists and news editors together should understand the fact-checking text time. So news editors should give the journalists a little bit more time to, to produce news. Um, it's not just about the headline and, and clicks, you know, like you need to have something that's accurate and that takes time. But we also need institutions, research institutions to, to, to value this. If I spend time fact-checking something with a journalist, uh, I want I want my contribution to be valid for my institution, right? Because after all, I need to publish as well. So if I'm not doing it, then what am I doing this time? Um, and when it comes to open access, of course, we need policymakers to, to to enforce this, but also institutions. Coming back quickly to, to this point, this is something we didn't analyze, but it's it's been seen before. This literature on this. Um, there's lots of uh, exaggerations and misleading headlines and news when it comes to scientific results being shared. And to be fair, the literature also points out it's not just journalists or editors' fault, right? So, yeah, of course, they, they clickbait a lot, you know, but it's it's also potentially our fault. Um, there's been papers reporting on the fact that authors of papers, usually in their abstract, they, they tend to boost their results a little bit, you know, to give them more importance so that the paper looks fancier and gets a broader audience and potentially collects more citations, which is um, ethically, I don't know, it's, it's something we should discuss, but then it's picked up by the university press uh, and like they issue press release, which is also usually emphasizing results a little bit more, and then journalists pick it up and they want to have readers interest so they emphasize it even more and in the end we might have a headline that's like completely different from what the papers actually say so it's it's pretty bad and it's something coming back to this definitely made the paper that i analyzed um, a little bit i looked at abstracts in my field and how people describe their results and um there's there's lots of things to do there i think uh and like give try to give potentially guidelines uh but yeah i i can talk about it more if you're interested but i don't think that's the topic of this presentation uh, basically, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. We've been through most of the solutions that we actually advertised for in the in the paper. Uh, of course, we're not naive. Uh, we know that all of these issues that we presented they existed before uh, COVID. The thing is, maybe COVID either made things worse or made it more visible because of the sheer number of papers that have been shared during the pandemic. Uh, I don't really know. Uh, I think it's hard to quantify, you know, mispractices overall in science. So it's hard to know how were things before and how they're now like it's really hard to quantify if it was amplified or not uh, but one thing we know also of course and we talk about this in the paper is that most of these issues probably happen because of of the way scientists are evaluated as well there's lots of incentives for scientists to not do a very thorough job we have to be honest with this like we need to publish a lot fast and thorough Publishing is not really mentioned much. It's like publishing this high impact factor journal, publish a lot of papers. That's 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 what you hear you need to do if you want to have a career in academia. But what about doing slow, robust science? Uh, maybe that should be emphasized a little bit more. So that's been raised in the past, the whole publish or perish uh, paradigm. And, you know, there's lots of problems associated with it and all the wrong incentives it gives to scientists. So it's been published a lot about um, in, in articles. I'm not going to go through this, but like, I point to two here. I also wrote a blog post a while ago with Paula and uh, John Tennant about this. Uh, there's lots of things that need to change, I think, if we want to get rid of these issues. And it has to be a systemic change. It's not just up to individuals. Um, there's been great initiatives as well started by other people, such as this Bulletin to Science initiative that basically says that 
if you're a young researcher and you feel like your PI or supervisors are pushing you to do things that are not really correct for science or against your own ethical or moral uh, ground, then you can ask them how to be helped for this and they, they have resources. It's a, it's, a, it's a very nice initiative. Uh, last thing I want to mention before we start discussing all of this is that this preprint was initially shared in uh, mid-August, I think the 14th of August, and we uh, gave people until the 31st of August to read the preprint, uh, give comments if they wanted to, and co-sign if they agreed. So they could decide to co-sign if they agreed with the issues we raised, if they agreed with the solution, or if they agreed with both. We collected a little bit more than 370 signatures. Uh, most of them agree with both. Uh, some of them didn't. Uh, it's all detailed in the version two of the paper uh, that's been released, I think, a month ago, uh, in which we actually took into account more than 100 comments that we got from these people. So it's uh, already peer review, very intense peer reviewing before previewing because the paper is still not submitted. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. So I'd be happy to have uh, discussions, questions uh, next. Great, thanks so much for, for that, Lonnie. That was such a